Push constants are a way to pass a small amount of constant data to a shader via a Vulkan command buffer rather than writes to memory or copy commands. In previous tutorials, I've shown how various commands can be recorded to a command buffer. For example, currently we begin the render pass, bind our simple graphics pipeline, bind the model, which in turn binds the associated vertex buffer data. And finally, we record a command to draw the vertex buffer data before ending the render pass. We can use the VK command push constants function to update arbitrary data to our command buffer before issuing a draw call. For example, we could use it to store an object's color or an X and Y offset to apply to each vertex in the vertex shader. Note that all vertices in the draw call must share the same push constant data. Additionally, it becomes really easy to draw multiple copies of the same object. In our command buffer, we first record the push constant data followed by a draw command. And simply by overwriting the push constant data with a different offset and a second draw command, we will have drawn our object twice, but at two different positions. Push constants have one major drawback, and that's their limited size. The Vulkan spec only guarantees 128 bytes of space. Some devices may provide more space, which can be checked using the max push constant size variable. Somewhat akin to how we need to provide binding and attribute descriptions to our graphics pipeline so that it knows what to expect for the format of the vertex buffer data. In the case of push constants, we need to provide push constant ranges to our pipeline layout. A push constant range is very simple and only contains three fields. The stage flags field specifies what shader stages will have access to this push constant range. For example, if I wanted this push constant range to be accessible only by the vertex shader, then I'd just use the VK shader stage vertex bit. The offset and size fields are the start offset and size in bytes consumed by the range. Note that the small capacity for push constants isn't per shader, so you can't get additional capacity by creating a different push constant range for each shader stage. The Vulkan spec only guarantees 128 bytes of space shared between all shader stages. So you could do something like create a range with the first 64 bytes for the vertex shader and a second range with the latter 64 bytes for the fragment shader. But unless you have a reason to specifically do so, I find it much more straightforward to use one shared push constant range for all shader stages. Okay, let's get to coding. First, I'm going to open the LVE model header and just copy these three lines, including the GLM library. Then I'll open the application implementation and paste them in near the top. Now, just inside the namespace, I'll declare a new struct called simple push constant data with a glm vec2 offset field and a glm vec3 color field. I'm declaring this in the app implementation because this is temporary and will eventually be restructured. Next in the create pipeline layout function, we need to provide a push constant range. So declare and initialize an empty vk push constant range called push constant range. Then set push constant range dot stage flags to VK shader stage vertex bit. Bitwise or operator followed by VK shader stage fragment bit. This signals that we want access to the push constant data in both the vertex and fragment shaders. Then set push constant range dot size to size of simple push constant data. You could also initialize the fields directly in the braces. Just below, update the pipeline layout info to have a push constant range count of one. And set the p push constant ranges field to equal the address of the local push constant range variable. Then scroll down to the record command buffer function. And underneath the model bind function call, create a for loop with int j equal to zero, j is less than four, and j plus plus. Then create a local simple push constant data instance called push. And initialize the push dot offset field to equal zero for the X offset and negative 0.4 plus J times 0.25 for the Y component. Next set push dot color equal to zero comma zero comma 0.2 plus 0.2 times J. 
So essentially, we're going to draw a vertical column of copies of our model that vary in color from dark to lighter blue. Now we need to record our push constant data to the command buffer. So call vk command push constants data with arguments command buffer at image index, pipeline layout, followed by the stage flags, so both the vertex and fragment bits, zero for the offset, then size of simple push constant data, and lastly, the address of the push data. Finally, move the model draw function call to inside the for loop. This way, our command buffer will now draw four copies of our model, with each copy using slightly different push data. The next step is to update the shader files to expect the push data. So navigate to your vertex shader file, and just above the main function add layout followed by push underscore constant in brackets, uniform push with a capital P, curly braces push with a lowercase p, semicolon. Then inside the braces add vec2 offset and vec3 color. Note that the order here must match the order specified in the simple push constant data struct. As far as I know, the name of the uniform doesn't really matter and can be whatever you want. I usually just use the same name as my instance starting with a capital. Also note that only one push constant block can be used per shader entry point. Anyway, next let's update the position value by adding push.offset. So within the draw call, this means that each vertex will be shifted by the same amount, effectively moving the entire model. Next, we could just set frag color equal to push.color, and then we wouldn't have needed to use the VK shader stage fragment bit. But instead, I'll remove this line, as well as the line declaring the frag color output variable. Then select and copy the entire layout definition and navigate to your fragment shader file. First, remove this line declaring the frag color input variable, and then above the main function, paste the push constant layout definition. The only remaining change is to update frag color to instead be push.color. Also, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in a previous video, but whatever build system you are using, I recommend setting it up so that your shader files are automatically compiled when you build the rest of your code. For example, in my make file, I have a build step that compiles any source shader file to an SPV file. It does this by finding all .vert and .frag files within the shader's directory, and then uses pattern sub to append the .spv suffix. Then these SPV file names are provided as dependencies for the target. Whether you use Xcode, Visual Studio, or any other build system, it is possible to set up something similar, and I recommend doing so. It's really frustrating to waste a bunch of time debugging only to realize that you haven't been compiling your shaders. So I'm going to build and run my code. And you can see here that these two lines echo that my shader files have been automatically recompiled. And huh, that's weird. The triangle is red, but I could have swore that we'd set the color to blue. To understand what is going wrong here, I need to talk about alignment requirements. Certain objects, such as uniforms and push constants, must be laid out to meet certain requirements. Scalars of size n have a scalar alignment of n. A vec2 has to be aligned by 2n. Vec3 and vec4s must be aligned to a multiple of 4n, and so on. This is easier to understand by looking at an example. When using a float precision of 32 bits, then our scalar value n equals 4 bytes. Therefore, a vec2 must be aligned by 8 bytes, and a vec3 must be aligned by 16 bytes. By default, the struct memory in the host's code is packed together tightly. Therefore, on the host, the memory looks something like this, where there is no space between the offset and color fields. But in device memory, the push constant struct layout requires the vec3 color to be aligned to a multiple of 16 bytes. So 8 bytes of padding will be automatically inserted between offset and color. Therefore, when we send over our data, the red and green channels are being ignored, and the blue channel is being read into the push constant's red channel. And that's why the blue triangle is appearing red. Alignment mistakes can be tricky to debug, since you won't likely ever see an error message. We can fix this by using C++11's align as specifier. 
just before the color decoration in the push constants data struct, add align as 16. Then build and run and your triangles should now be blue, since the host memory layout now matches the push constants memory layout in the shader. Finally, for some fun, let's add a bit of motion. This will be easy to do because as of the last tutorial, we've started recording to a command buffer every frame. By varying the push constant data each frame, we can create animations. So back in the record command buffer function, I'm going to declare a variable with static int frame equal to zero, followed by frame is equal to frame plus one in brackets, mod, let's say a thousand. So this way our animation will loop every thousand frames. Next, I'm going to change my clear color to be 0.01 to set a darker background color, and then update the X component of push.offset to be negative 0.5 plus frame times 0.002. So I'm going to build and run my code. That seems a bit slow, so I'll make things quicker. But note this is just a temporary method I'm using to demonstrate animations. Game loop timing is a whole topic in its own right, with trade-offs between pinning animations to the frame rate, or the system's real-time clock, etc. In summary, push constants are an easy and performant way to pass dynamic data to a shader. Compared to the alternative method of using descriptor sets and uniform buffers, push constants are much simpler for us to implement and will typically perform better for data that updates frequently. However, besides the obvious disadvantage of being limited in size, they are not always the best way for passing data that updates on a per frame basis. This is because minimizing draw calls is also a great way to increase performance. One way to do this is by grouping models into a single vertex buffer. So for example, instead of bind model one, draw model one, bind model two, draw model two, and so on, if I put models 1, 2, and 3 all into a single vertex buffer, then I would only need one bind and one draw command to draw all three models. However, this would not be possible if using a push constant per model. Reducing three draw calls wouldn't affect performance, but reducing hundreds or thousands of draw calls will start to add up. Finally, one of the most common uses for push constants is to store a transformation matrix. A transformation matrix is a rectangular array of numbers that can represent a variety of transforming operations such as rotations, scaling, translations, and so on. We will cover transformation matrices in the next tutorial as we prepare for three-dimensional rendering. So I extremely recommend watching at least the first five episodes of this wonderful series introducing the mathematics of linear algebra by 3Blue1Brown. Having a good geometric understanding of linear transformations is a requirement for understanding how 3D graphics actually works. A link to this as well as all the other resources are in the description below. And thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Cheers.